So with this uh, histogram, which is very simple technology, even Excel has histograms, uh, we, can f we look for Higgs, and it's just that little bump in that uh, the top uh, uh, graph you see at around, um, this is a plot of the number of events observed as a function in this case here of the mass of two photons. Uh, here we are using sort of theoretical understanding. We expect the Higgs to decay into two photons, uh, among other final states. <coughs> and you see an excess of events at around 126 uh, GeV. Remember, protons are 0.98 uh, GeV, so this is much heavier than the proton. That's why these protons have to be such high energy. You're not going to produce a Higgs from two protons to colliding unless you have a lot of energy, which you can convert back into mass. So to make that more precise, you uh, do a model fit. This is something we've, uh, we've discussed, that uh, the process of analyzing data often requires making models. Here the model is a so-called background, which is by definition smooth. That is just the polynomial in the math, in the in the mass. And then you have some background, which is probably um, a so-called bright Wigner or equivalent uh, form, um, um, and probably a Gaussian distribution centered at the mass with a certain width. And then you do that uh, two-component fit. You'll see the Higgs comes plonking out at 126 GeV. And then on the bottom graph, you actually subtract the background from the data, and you get the um, results shown there with a clear peak. Uh, we will discuss uh, later on when we come to the use case what those, how those error bars are calculated, because the error bar is uh, very important. But the thing to remember for all this type of data, this is counting data. When you count data and you'll find um, n events here, n is around 2,000 at the Higgs. The error in the um, 2,000 is square root of 2,000. At least that's the count, so-called counting error, the statistical error. That could well be model dependent or, or experiment bias dependent errors as well. But probably the counting error is the most significant. And that is square root of 2,000. So here's a little note um, about myself. So um, back in 1964, which was quite a long time ago, I was listening to a lecture on particle physics by a professor at uh, Cambridge University. And he told me that bumps, like we saw from the previous uh, graph, I've just reproduced it here, were particles. And I was totally amazed. I could not believe that a bump was a particle. Because I thought particles were round things that um, buzz back and forth. And so I found that uh, more intriguing than any other subject I was taught at the time. Um, and um, so I decided that I would do my PhD in this area. So it shows how deep the principles are which should determine your career. Um, so um, I've already pointed out about errors. Errors are the square root of the number of events in the bin. And there is a, a result called the central limit theorem and also the law of large numbers, which will basically describe the design and study of the, such experiments. If you look at the actual methodology, the process, this process is the use of histograms. And a um, long time ago, I used to write, in fact, I, I worked on such experiments. Uh, around uh, the end of the 1970s, and I used to write histogram programs, which were very relatively sophisticated, actually more powerful than the ones available in Excel today. And uh, uh, there is a program I wrote called Papoose. Um, that's because it was a derivative of another program called Kiowa. And um, you, it's even been, you will find the uh, code uh, online at this uh, URL. These used to run in those days on the so-called CDC 7600, which was a wonderful computer of those times. And um, we used to access it over, over what the pass for the internet in those days. Um, of course, all that code has been thrown away. It used to exist on uh, punch cards. Those cards were tossed out. I do happen to have the perforated paper printout 
of the program of, the, uh, of this particular program, which is shown here. So that's this was the Fortran subroutine which zeroed the histograms and the other things we used to which you, you do also use, namely scatter plots, which are just two-dimensional plots, uh, which are also useful for some some parts of this analysis. But this is pretty simple statistics. And that's what is used to find the Higgs. Uh, so now let's make a, a little more comments on what a model is and what a theory is. So Newton's law, which is uh, roughly mass times acceleration is force, is a theory. And Einstein has theories like special relativity and gravitation. And Maxwell has a theory for electromagnetism, Maxwell's laws. And there is something called the Grand Unified Theory, which actually is predicted, which predicts or expects the Higgs, Higgs or particle, which is sometimes called the God particle. So those are theories. Um, now theories, and some are often incomplete because you don't know some information. In particular, uh, for the Grand Unified Theory, one did not know the mass uh, because, uh, and so. It was not possible to predict the Higgs. It's also not possible to um, calculate reliably what happens when two protons collide and produce a Higgs. You can produce models, which are approximations to the theory. So this was something I used to do continuously, which is to write so-called phenomenological models, which were complicated, parameterized, uh, um, uh, equations which which were used to um, understand what happened when this type of event was produced. And those models are still very important. The experimentalists use it to learn where to look, because the models tell you where the Higgs might be seen most precisely, and also to interpret backgrounds and things like that. So. Um, Here's an example of a simpler model, <coughs> which is um, which I found from Wikipedia, where we have some uh, model which uh, suggests that the change in the gross domestic product is related to the change in the unemployment rate, and you can see some linear relationship. So this is so-called regression model, which says that uh, the relationship between these two um, um, numbers uh, is a um, straight line, and you can see uh, the data is plotted as a scatter plot, and then that scatter plot is fitted to a straight line. And so that's meant to be Occam's law. So you will find I gave you the Wikipedia link here, but that's that is a model, and so models are uh, not theories because theories are meant to be true. Models are meant to be approximations. Uh, so here's an example of a model I made with some famous uh, physicists, Richard Feynman and uh, Rick Field was um, a colleague of mine at that time. He's now at the University of Florida. And you can see it was written in 1978. And actually, if you look at his citations, they're sort of interesting. Yeah, there are a few when it came out. And uh, then it's actually had somewhat more recently because of these experiments which are looking at, uh, at the type of events we try to make models for. The new models are obviously better than the models we had, but probably we had roughly the right principles in those days. Uh, it's, there's just been more detail now that allows you to make better models. Um, so this points out one reason I actually did not continue working in physics. The field is moving slower than computing. And we're finally discovering things which uh, we sort of knew ought to be discoverable uh, 40 years ago. And um, now we finally got the apparatus built and the data analyzed to show that this is true. So here we come to a different field of science. Uh, this comes from the European Bioinformatics Institute. This is uh, data I took from their uh, annual reports and uh, such information. And this is a plot of the number of jobs as a function of time from 2006. Uh, 
probably to the end of 2012. And you see the total number of jobs is clearly increasing by around a factor of 10 over this time period. And uh, if you look at where the jobs are coming from, the new jobs are all coming from so-called web services, which is essentially saying they're coming not from real people requesting jobs. They're coming from other computer programs requesting jobs running on EBI. Of course, those other computer programs came from people, so it, these are, they're all actually people um, invoked, but, but it points out when you have your clouds, your clouds are running services, those services are processing data. Often those services are not directly invoked by people, they're just invoked by other computer programs. And that's so-called workflow, where one program will call another program, which calls another program, and so on. And this uh, pipeline, or possibly more complex graph structure of programs, is what is needed to analyze the data. So um, here is uh, slightly more detailed information uh, showing the um, data stored at EBI. And this is not the job submitted, but data stored. And you can see, in all, and it's got various uh, types of data from nucleotides to genomes to proteins, and they all increase. Um, and the uh, genomic data is increased, sequence data is increasing faster than the other data.